So the surface is made up of four line cement concrete, which is a rigid pavement. Then there is flexible pavement. When I say flexible pavement, I mean a black top road. Why it is black is because the surface material is an asphalt. Some of you might be confused between asphalt and a beetle. Asphalt is a black to brown sticky material that are dry from the bitumen and that is obtained from the fractional distillation of crude petroleum. So whenever you have a crude petroleum, when you extract oils out of it, whatever remains in the last and what is a bitumen? Bitumen can be from crude oil or it can be from some other sources like fossils. Now, you have to understand the dividing line between asphalt and bitumen. The word is very simple. The sentence is very simple. As every asphalt is a bitumen, but not every bitumen is an asphalt. Bitumen may be an asphalt, it may be a pitch, it may be a coal tar. So you have to distinguish between asphalt. Normally, nowadays, whatever the road we built, we built it in asphalt. We don't use it use tar or any other material for construction of paper. Then we say the composite which means there used to be a concrete pavement but after some time we have overlaid with an asphalt pavement. So it's a composite pavement that is a pavement that is made up of both flexible and rigid material. Normally the rigid material, rigid concrete is at the bottom and flex asphalt is at the top. Now, it's a typical flexible pavement. It consists of actually five layers. There's a surface course, normally 50 mm. Then the binder course, this is 100 mm. And both of them are made of asphalt means in these two layers aggregate is binded with an asphalt then the third layer we call a base course layer or generally we call this an aggregate base course layer it is an unbounded material and it go up to 300 mm thickness uh, then there is a sub base material may required or may not be required but again most of the time we do provide subbase material it is of some inferior quality and it is of the aggregate size is larger than the base course and then there is a compacted subgrade and then an existing subgrade what we do if we need to construct a road on any strata first we level it remove the excessive material like topsoil or grass from it and then we compact it by our rollers and then we start building the layers. In between this diagram there are three terminologies that are seal coat, tech coat and prime coat. Actually the prime coat and tech coats are the asphalt binders applied directly to the surface just like painting a surface. So when we paint or we apply a layer of an asphalt on a base course that is termed as prime coat. Obviously when you have an asphalt course, binder course then you lay an asphalt binder course and after that 
before laying a surface course, you apply another coat that is contact coat. And these coats are meant to glue the layers together, to bind the layers. That is, to bind the binder coats and base coats. We need a glue. That glue is an asphalt binder, and that is known as prime coat. And then there is a layer we need to have a tech coat to bind bundle coats and surface coats. Mind you, you may not require tech coat when you are constructing binder coats and surface coats within uh, within few hours. But if you have constructed a binder course earlier, you may need to have a tech coat. But what is a seal coat? There are different types of a seal coat. The seal coat is to cover the voids. In the previous slide, I said the pave, we should have used a material that, that caused pavement to be impermeable. So that's why we need to have an extra layer. This can be a layer of aggregate Small aggregate may be number 50 size aggregate coated with an asphalt or it's just a sand seal. What, what you do, you spread a sand once the surface course is finished. So this is how the typical flexible pavement and what we call a conventional flexible pavement section is constructed. The roads, the pavement you see in your area is normally of this type. Then, as I explained, the composite pavement, it is an uh, existing concrete and we have overlaid it with an asphalt pavement. Mainly, you can see when you, the concrete pavement need repair, we do it with asphalt to, to save some cost. Then there is a concrete pavement. What is a concrete pavement? Now there are few things you can notice. The concrete pavement does not have many layers as the conventional flexible pavement. As you can see, there are three layers. The, the top layer is the top layer you can see is this made up of concrete, and there are grids. What, and these grids are called the joints. So there are joints between along the length of the pavement, and there is a joint dividing the pavement into one half. So whenever if, if this is a two-layer pavement, there will be one joint. And if you have you have to construct one more layer, obviously there will be two lines and two longitudinal joints. In the due course of time, I will discuss why those joints are needed. Now, you can see this must have a smooth and a surface. Then on the side of it, all the transfer joints are connected by a towel. The owl bar is simply a two fit length or a 600 mm length bar, normally of size 20 mm or 12 mm. It is half of it is on one side and the half is the other side. And similarly, to join two longitudinal sections or longitudinal joint, we have a tie bar. Actually, they provide connectivity between these two slabs. If the tie bars or dowel bars are not present, they may, there will be a differential settlement between the pavement or pavement. One of the slab may get broken. So that's why we need this. The base or sub base is simply it's an aggregate base course, 
or it can be a lean concrete base as you know from your structural design or from your engineering writing knowledge the lean concrete you know so you can say there is a rich mix concrete like in the foundation we have and then it is on laid on a lean mix and then they are supported on the support uh, uh pardon me for this uh, switching this gravel pavement should have come before now the gravel pavement is what is the aggregate base pavement if you do not do anything on it just remain it like this so these are low cost roads some of the roads you may not require an asphalt surface because there is less traffic uh, it is just providing less grade so you just after compacting the base layer aggregate base layer you just leave it like this so this is what we call a gravel pavement or we call an unsurface pavement uh, this is how this pavement is defined now let's discuss what are the types of the flexible pavement there is technically the conventional pavement are known as a partial gap pavement partial gap means half of them is asphalt the other rest of is the aggregate full gap means all the layers are made of an asphalt and there is other thing this what cream 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 c stand for contained rock asphalt mat contained rock asphalt pavement or you can see it's a sandwich pavement i will show you the diagram in a little while so when i say partial depth it means a surface layer actually the binder and wiring posts are combined together then the base layer the base layer and sub base are combined together so there is an hma layer hot mix asphalt layer laid over base layer aggregate base layer and they are laid off sub grade remember before laying a layer the the bottom layer should be compacted so first the sub grade you get get compact sub grade then you lay a base layer then you compact it then you lay a hma layer that is a partial depth flexible pavement the other form is that i have shown previously it's a conventional pavement and look at this full depth asphalt pavement all asphalt on a compact surface it is used where the countries doesn't have the aggregate resources and they have abundant in asphalt so they use it as the way of constructing asphalt pavement then what you see this contained rock asphalt pavement mat and what i see a sandwich is that there is an asphalt layer at the top and there is a asphalt layer at the bottom and in between them there is there is an aggregate layer so that is what called a sandwich pavement or we can say it's a cream pavement cream pavement is not very popular it is being practiced and it is still being researched on but the common practice is the conventional pavement let's see the types of rigid pavement uh this are called joint j p c t jointed plane cement concrete pavement it has got closely spaced joints and it may not need towels then at the type is what we called j r c p jointed reinforced concrete pavement it's just like the slab roof slab of your home or the roof slab of your underground water tank it's a reinforced pavement different slab so what this reinforcement do it for uh, for this you can have a longer joints and that's why 
this reinforcement could help. Then there is what we call a continuous reinforced concrete payment. It has no joint at all together. But the problem is then when there is a transverse cracks, it do appear and it's still it being researched on. But nowadays, people prefer constructing CRCP payment, continuous reinforced concrete, because it has less joints. Then there is a pre-stress concrete payment. It's just like a pre-stress member in which compressive stress are already applied and it is less prone, it is a longer life. And one of the advantages is that whenever one slab, you can, it's just like a cast in situ slab, you can place it, you can construct it anywhere, and then you place it and you place it uh, during uh, the pavement without disturbing much of the infrastructure. So these are the typical sections of a rigid pavement. So when I say JPCP, you see these joints. Normally these joints are 15 to 20 feet, and these are lane joints. These lanes depends upon the lane width, normally 12 feet, 10 feet, 9 feet, depending on the road traffic. And on the profile, you can see dowels. So some JPCP have dowels, some do not have. But it's good to have a dowels. Then this at JRCP, you can see by when you have a reinforcement, this joint spacing can be increased to 30 feet. And you can see at the profile there is a mesh. And it's, it's just like a cantilever slab in which the reinforcement is laid above the center line of the pavement. Right? And then there is a CRCP pavement, no joint at all, but you can see there are some cracks. This may not be a structural crack, but still they look ugly and they can confuse the tire one. And this is a very good diagram. You see how the load is transformed? It's just simply a deflection. It's just like a deflecting beam deflecting from the load, just like we do the structural design of any beam during of, of a building. Now the load transfer mechanism in rigid flexible pavement is different. Is that the load is transferred gradually to the subject. So there is a trapezoidal loading. So if you have a 150 psi tire pressure, you have to design the pavement in such a manner that the load can reduce to 3 psi. And this will depend upon the depth and obviously the type of the material. On the right hand side of the figure, this is what we will call the, the mirror image. Obviously, the impact of the force here is high and that's why the stress at this point is very high. And as you go to the bottom, the stress becomes reduced. It's just a pressure pull and you can see for an effective pavement, this bulb must, this bulb must be, must have its maximum value before the subgrade starts. Otherwise, if it penetrates your subgrade, then your the thickness of the pavement is not it. Now, if you look at the load transfer mechanism of rigid pavement, you can see all the load is being taken care of by the rigid pavement because of its flexural strength. And the load is somehow, or the pressure bulb is somehow equally distributed. And this diagram shows why we need a towel bar. If you don't have a towel by here, what would happen if the wheel comes this, at this point, this slab may would have settled and this may have gone up. So what you, what this tire bar, what this towel bar is doing 
it's keeping the loads that's why we need dowels in the joints so let's now formally see how you can differentiate a flexible and rigid payment as a transportation engineering engineer you must understand you must know how to differentiate between flexible and rigid payment it's very simple rigid is a form flexible is of that's what you see if 3000 kg of load is applied the pressure is less than 0.2 megapascal in rigid pavement and as compared to 2 megapascal for the same load that's why we say rigid pavements are the long lasting payment they require more time to get broken so let's discuss in detail as you can understand the flexible pavement it has more layers as compared to the port length cement or rigid pavement that has got smaller layer but all of them have high flexible strength you must understand this thing you know asphalt is used as a binder in flexible pavement so is portland cement used in binder in rigid pavement the concrete when we say concrete and asphalt concrete means aggregates coarse and fine mixed with an asphalt right when we say cement concrete means coarse and fine aggregates they are mixed with a cement concrete so what's the difference the difference is the asphalt does not adds any strength any compressive strength to the concrete material while portland cement has its own its own strength so when there is a concrete made of cement both aggregate and cement together adds to the strength of the pavement and like flexible pavement though aggregates are binded but the only one that is available to survive the load that's why we need more layer as well now the flexible pavement it reflects the deformations on the surface while in the rigid pavement it just is a bridge over localized failures and it's just like acting as a simply supported beam the stability depends on the aggregate interlock particle friction and cohesion between the aggregates and now as i have said rigid pavement all the strength is provided by the slab itself so aggregate has a smaller contribution as compared to the flexible pavement yes the pavement design is greatly influenced by sublet strength but in a rigid pavement if the flexural strength of concrete is a major factor you will be surprised to know the flexural strength of concrete is around 600 to 700 mega or uh, 700 psi and if you find the equivalent compressive strength we are talking about 6000 psi concrete and you will be wondering that the pre stress gutter you can see on the bridges they also have a compressive strength of 